Hey guys, welcome to episode one of Lies So Clever. The phrase lies so clever, that comes from a specific scripture in the, in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter four, verse 14 says, then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever, they sound like the truth. From the very beginning of our faith, there were, there were those who took the teachings of Jesus and the core principles of our, of our faith and they twisted them. And by the way, that's something that's been happening uh, for thousands of years. If you study scripture, early on in the Bible, the book of Genesis, the very first temptation, the very first sin that we have recorded is, is Satan taking the things that God had said and twisting them to confuse people, to lead us astray. And that's just an old trick that, that he has and he's used it for years. And he's not only used it with the things that God said in the Old Testament, like way back when, he, he does it with the teachings of Jesus as well. From the very earliest stages of our faith, there were those who, who came about and introduced different ideas, different versions of the message of Jesus. And if you study the teachings of the New Testament, you find that the leaders of the early church, that this is one of the things that they were absolutely intensely focused on making sure did not happen. We find so many scriptures where, where men like the Apostle Paul were adamant in saying, no, 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 do not be deceived. Do not be led astray by, by false teachings. It's interesting, a few years ago, I, I, I injured my ankle pretty badly playing basketball. And, and had to go through the whole process of getting x-rays, MRIs, I had to have surgery. And it's amazing how much I actually learned about the way my ankle worked by, by going through an injury. Well, the same is true when we study some of these more prominent false teachings that, that come from the past, but also still influence the way that many people think today. By studying the injury, we learn a lot about the way things should actually work. And that's the whole purpose of this series, is we wanna study some of the more famous false teachings uh, of the past and again, many of these teachings still take root today and still influence people's thinking today, but, but by studying these, we actually come to better understand what our faith is all about. And if we better understand what our faith is all about, we're more ready to experience the fullness that, that God has for us in terms of His peace, His joy, His power. But if we allow ourselves to be influenced by, by these false teachings, by lies so clever that they sound like the truth, we find that those, those incredible blessings that God has for us, they, they tend to get a little bit undermined. So I'm not gonna do this by myself. Uh, I've got a really good friend with me. This is Fred Goodwin. Fred, thank you for, uh, My for being here today. Good to be with you. Uh, some of you guys who are part of his hands, you guys, you guys know Fred, uh, you've seen Fred speak. Uh, but if you're watching this and his hands isn't your church, you're just kind of checking this out. This is Fred Goodwin. Fred's been a, a pastor, how long? How long? I say were, but I don't think you ever like, you're still a pastor. Yes, yeah, sure, 36 years. 36 years. Um, Fred has been a mentor of mine for these last few years, and I just greatly enjoy talking with him. He knows, he knows, he knows his stuff, and so I'm glad that you're you're here with us. We're going to talk about a very specific, uh, early, early false teaching in the history of the church called Pelagianism. Uh, Pelagianism, not a phrase that, or, or a word that most people have have heard of, and with good reason, I imagine. It comes from the fourth century. Uh, but this is something that the early church would have labeled as a, a heresy. And we were talking just a minute ago, you know, we hear the word heresy or, or heretic, and I think there's almost this sort of caricature mm. uh, idea of like uh, the Spanish Inquisition, medieval churches burning people at the stake, you know, sure. and whatever. Um, and, and the truth of the matter is the word heresy, it's a really simple, it's a simple phrase. What, what, is, what is a heresy? It's wrong truth. Wrong truth. It's, it's twisted. It's, okay. it's not the orthodox, which is the term, the orthodox faith, the early church leaders had to figure out what is the real faith that will give life and mm -hmm. fullness to us in our walk with Christ versus that which may sound good, mm -hmm. but ultimately will lead us away and will, will damage not only our walk with the Lord, but our souls themselves and yeah. perhaps for eternity. Yeah, and, and you see this really early in scripture, right? Like like Paul actually has some of his strongest language for false teachers, oh, absolutely. you know? And sometimes that was people who were uh, trying to reintroduce uh, the, the legalism uh, of mm -hmm. Judaism back into Christianity. Sometimes it was people who were just integrating uh, 
modern philosophical ideas from the Greek world and trying to mesh that with, with the faith. And, and he says a few times, I, I believe like one of the strongest things Paul ever said was, if anyone comes to you and preaches a different gospel than the one I preached, let that person be cursed. Be cursed. That's, a, that's a pretty intense thing to say. Intense. And so I, I, it's interesting because I've definitely grown up in a time when, you know, I would say that most, most Jesus followers, even in people who are working in ministry, probably have a pretty lax attitude toward the idea of heresy. Like, you know, oh, that's it. like, ah, you gotta be more open-minded. You know, that's, that's kind of the typical thing. And that's definitely how I thought. But as, as I've matured and gotten older, I've realized that no, no, no. If, if you start to chip away at some of these very unique core aspects of our faith, you, the whole thing crumbles in terms of our, our ability to experience the very blessings that we're promised to experience. And it's very important that we actually know what, what the teachings of Jesus are and, and what the, the gospel, the message of Jesus actually means so that we experience what he's promised us to experience. And those false teachings, those heresies, they, they, they chip away at that, they undermine it. One of my mentors years ago taught me that if you uh, stand for everything, if you accept everything, you'll ultimately stand for nothing. Mm. We have to know what is not truth and be able to recognize it in the way we live our lives so that we can be grounded in the solid foundation of Jesus Christ. Mm. That's good, man. That's, that's really good. And so over the course of, of these episodes, we're going to go through some uh, of the more famous or influential false teachings that had taken root at different times. Like I said a few minutes ago, we're going to do Pelagianism today. Okay. Uh, we're not going to spell it. We're just going to talk about it. I may um, not be able to. <laughs> <laughs> many, many um, but, but let's do this first. Pelagianism was a it was a, a heresy of false teaching that really uh, had a, a pretty big following in the fourth century. Mm -hmm. uh, Pelagius fourth century, but the fourth century is a really critical time in the history of, of the church. Why? The Christian faith was uh, an illegal faith okay. in the Roman Empire from literally the time of Jesus on. And that, uh, the Jews in the year 67 at the Council of Jamnia said, those Christians are not part of us. The Jews were the only faith that were given special elite status to worship one God. Everybody else was expected to worship these Romans and Greek gods right. and goddesses. So here were these Christians that said there is only one God. And so church was that which was underground and people had to have secret messages to one another. It wasn't until Constantine uh, became the emperor and following a, a vision he had of putting the cross on battle uh, standards and winning a battle where he became the new emperor that he allowed Christianity to be legal. And, that, and that's over 300 years after Jesus. Yes, that was so, the year 411. Okay, so first 400 years of, of Christianity, uh, being a Christian was an incredibly risky thing. Uh, you could be, you were persecuted intensely like Emperor Nero, exactly. one of the more famous persecutors of the church. Uh, to, to follow Jesus was and oftentimes to risk your, your very life. Often it would cost your life. Okay, and so then Constantine has this vision. He's the emperor, mm -hmm. and it's the vision of the, the cross, and mm -hmm. he, he, he tells his soldiers to put it on their shields, they win a battle, and then what, what, what did Constantine like? I, the way I've always heard it is that he basically made Christianity the official religion of Rome shortly yeah, it, after that. It wasn't a formal declaration. Okay. It was just the recognition that he was becoming increasingly a Christian. Okay. And so with, for the first time, the Christian leaders who had been literally in hiding around the entire Roman Empire could become uh, free to get together and discuss things. And the emperor uh, encouraged the leaders to get together. And so for the first time in uh, the year 325, in Nicaea in Italy, leaders from all over the world, you know, Africa, Middle East, Europe, Asia, uh, came together and said, okay, okay, what is the faith? And that was in 325? Right. A minute ago, I think we said Constantine was four, was it, is he 311? Oh, sorry. Three, yes. Three, okay. Three. So early 300s Th is where we're yes. at. Okay. Fourth early, century. Fourth yes. century. Yes. That's, that's yeah, always, yeah, yeah, I yeah. hate how that works. Yeah, it's me too. Like, <laughs> fourth century means three. Yeah, like, yeah. Well, they should have just uh, made that first century, century zero. Not count. It would have made everything <laughs> work that's better. Right. So, so first 300 years of our faith, Everything's underground now. Now the emperor is a Christian, but and it becomes you can be a public Christian now for the first time. For the first time, and some of these Christian leaders now actually have some some prominence, and they can sort of come out of hiding. But at that point in time, even though the church was incredibly persecuted, it had still spread all over the world. All over the world, right? So now you've got now you've got people openly discussing Christianity. And, uh, and I imagine the emperor being someone who you said was gradually becoming a Christian, there's probably mm -hmm. still a lot of old 
uh, Roman ideas and Greek ideas Absolutely. intermixing. And so uh, pretty early in the process of, of all this, you mentioned a specific council that got together. What was that council? That was the Council of Nicaea. Okay. Anybody who has a, has a background in liturgical church will, will recognize that came out of that was the Nicene Creed. What, what does liturgical mean for people? Liturgical is, is a, a more standard form of worship that is based on having a, a regular practice of the communion service. Okay. In a, and that is the central part of worship. Okay. Uh, it's a, a worship that in many ways is focused with um, the Father where another branch, the evangelicals, are focused on Jesus. Okay. The charismatics are focused on the spirit. Liturgical churches are more focused on the Father. Shouldn't we be focused on all three? Yes, we should. Okay, okay. that's good <laughs> enough. Absolutely. That's good enough. But, but and I, we're discovering that now. Yeah, we are, and I, but like uh, people have a different propensity sometimes. It's easy for some people, easier for some people to really grab a hold of Father and the order of things. Exactly. And some people, it's the, the char like you say, charismatic, it's the Holy Spirit and the spontaneity of that and others it's Jesus and just the love and compassion and it's easier for us, to, I think it's easy for all of us to gravitate to one or the other, but yeah, we should have all three. Exactly. Um, but Nicene uh, Council. Yes, the Nicene Council, for them, there was no confusion over who the Father was, the creator okay. of heaven and earth. But then a whole paragraph needed to be written, who is this Jesus? Mm -hmm. What do we really be believe about Jesus? And that's when they, they took on Pelagian, who was actually a, a British monk, well-educated, very popular. Yeah. And he had an opinion that they have, uh, ultimately came to realize was not the faith. It was not helpful. Okay. And what was that what was that belief? What he, what now we're talking about Pelagianism. So Pelagianism. We're four, 4th century which is 300s, right. <laughs> which is weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 4th century 300. Constantine's emperor, Christianity's becoming a an official thing. Uh, so now there's this this public discourse happening about what Christianity is, and obviously there's a lot of disagreement about the, the, the specifics of what that means. Mm -hmm. Now there's this need to bring it together. We've got to figure out, hey, what, what does it mean to be a Christian? What, what do we really believe? Specifically relating to who Jesus is, you said at this point mm -hmm. in time, the earliest heresies were all kind of about- They really were. Who Jesus is, mm -hmm. right? Pelagius, what, what are the core ideas that Pelagius has uh, that, that became a, a point of contention? His big emphasis and those who, who actually practiced that in that time, very popular, was that God has given us free will to make choices. And God would certainly have not given us something like the Ten Commandments if we weren't capable of being faithful to them. Okay. So that we have the ability to choose right from wrong, mm -hmm. and we have the ability to be faithful. Okay. And Jesus came as an example for us to understand uh -huh. how to do that. Okay. It wasn't that there was, there was not sin. They were not claiming that we make poor choices. What they were saying is, if we work harder at it, we can do it because, after all, we're basically good. Humans are basically good. So as we say this, that sounds uh, very familiar. Yes, it does. Right? <laughs> very, very modern. So I, I imagine many people watching this would probably nod their head in agreement to be like, okay, I, I like, for me, an example, I believe in free will, mm -hmm. right? I think that God gives us mm -hmm. choices. There's many times in scripture where he tells us, choose, Choose wisely, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, I believe that we have the capacity to make good decisions, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Um, so help help me understand how th what you're saying, because again, what, what sure. uh, many would probably really like, I don't see how that's a heresy, Yeah. right? Uh, that seems like a little intensely strong of a, of a word for that. How does, how does that idea come against the truth of who Jesus is and what it really means to be Jesus' follower? Ultimately, it means we don't need the cross. Mm. We don't need divine grace, and that was the term they used. Okay. We don't need divine grace because we'll just try harder. Okay. Uh, it, it, with, with those in our present day who do not practice faith, we would call them humanists. Right. Who believe it's just our own self. We don't need God. Yeah, yeah. Secular, secular humanism means secular that human. apart from God, uh, we have everything within us to, to realize our ultimate good. Like Absolutely. we can just we can do it in our if we're well educated enough, if we try hard enough, uh, we we can do it. And so, so Pelagius teaches that no people have you have the ability to live a life uh, worthy of God's approval. With that, we we could. They would even have said, and they did, that you can become holy. You can become holy on your own. So that's that's really the key, mm -hmm. right? It's so it's where it becomes kind of a nuanced thing. But but it's funny as we, as we study these things. Um, I was reading a leadership book years ago uh, by a, a guy that I really admire. Uh, I admire him because 
he's a coach of the uh, sport that I love. Yeah. Uh, I bet you can't guess what it is. <laughs> Not saying a word. Like golf. He's yeah. a golf. No, oh, no. Uh, but one of the things he talked about is how a lot of people for years had, had complained that you know his team seems to get away with things and all this kind of stuff and and they're like oh you probably pay the refs off and he's like no no we practice the nuances of the game mm -hmm. and that was really profound to me because he said if, if you become good at the nuances you really master what you're mm -hmm. doing and i think the truth of the matter is our faith like anything uh has nuance mm -hmm. and if we understand the nuances uh, it really helps us be able to identify those, those false teachers, those lies so clever they sound like the truth. Because everything that you're saying that Pelagius taught sounds, at first glance, like pretty good. And it's logical, right? Like you said, he's reconciling the idea that, uh, well, God gave us free will and then he gave us the Ten Commandments. Clearly, God would God give us something, would he tell us to do something if he knew we couldn't do it? That didn't make sense to him. That makes sense. I have found that a lot of false teachings where they really seem to develop is when people are trying so hard to reconcile mysteries that they end up I mean honestly it's like they can't handle a paradox they can't mm -hmm. handle the idea that, that two things can be true at the same time right. Jesus Christ is both 100% human mm -hmm. and 100% God mm -hmm. that's a, what does that even mean so let's try to reconcile that and in trying to reconcile too much and elevating human logic you get all all off track go all, all twisted right it isn't that we aren't meant to live good lives we're called to live good lives okay but our living of the good life is the response that the father first loves us okay and we see that in the forgiveness and grace extended uh, by jesus in his faithfulness on the cross that then sets us free and to use our free will to make wise choices okay we're not earning god's grace or even our entry into heaven mm -hmm. or even blessings mm -hmm. we receive blessings so we respond accordingly now it's played out in the church i find with many uh, who decide that well my child is perfect right or even at the deathbed i've had Mine aren't. <laughs> yeah no uh, uh, the deathbed i've had people say to me i hope i'm good enough right and my heart just breaks how can one be in church their whole lives and say, I hope I'm good enough. Well, let's 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 park there for a second and, okay. and back up a little bit. Sure. So, you know, again, a lot of this stuff that Pelagius said, people are basically good, mm -hmm. which means that people have it within themselves to live a holy life they and do. a life that's pleasing God. And Jesus, in Pelagius' mindset, Jesus is not so much the savior who freed us from from our our destruction, right? Right. He's the example that proves to us that we can do it. We can do it. If Jesus did it, then you, you got no excuse. You, you can do it. Um, let's talk for a second about a core concept. I, I, I believe, uh, well, you tell me if you believe this, that the idea of original sin is a pretty core concept mm -hmm. in, the, Absolutely. In, in believing in, G, in the, the Christian movement. Mm -hmm. uh, I, Pelagius would have denied Absolutely did original deny, sin. Absolutely uh, denied okay. original sin. Tell us what, what, what is original sin? Because I think understanding this is really important to seeing where the lie uh, of Pelagianism gets things off track. Original sin is the recognition that when our story of faith goes all the way back to Adam. Okay. That Adam and Eve chose to disobey God okay. and eat the fruit of the knowledge of the good and evil. And since then, we have within our DNA a fallen state, a fallen nature that is we're driven by self. It's meaning that no human being in their own strength, no human being in and of themselves could will themselves to a truly holy life. We, we, we will never be good enough. Right. And, and that whole good enough question can be literally put like the high bar for a high jumper. How good is good enough? Right. Uh, when, when Paul said he was the most wretched of all sinners, when Mother Teresa, just a, a couple decades ago, she said, I was, I'm the most wretched of all sinners. If, if gee, I would have thought they would have been real close to the bar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If they're the most wretched, where does that put me? Where does it put you, right? <laughs> and, and, but the only one who got over the holy bar, the perfect bar, right. is Jesus. Is Jesus. And so, you know, it's funny, original sin, the idea that we're born with a fallen nature, yeah. uh, that, that in many ways, it's very offensive to people, mm -hmm. right? Because I think a lot of people, even a lot of Jesus followers, but no, we are basically good. And uh, it's interesting, though, because two things really hit me on that. Number one, I think about my kids. You know, I've got mm -hmm. four. You've got three, mm -hmm. uh, so I win. Um, <laughs> uh, so, uh, but you've raised your four, your yes. three. I haven't. So I, I'm not. I'm teasing. Uh, but man, my kids—they have so many issues, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, there's selfishness, and there's, and each of them has their own thing. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? They all like. 
And if there's no such thing as original sin, if they were born good, that means, logically, if we're gonna play that logic it, it, out, that all of their issues are my fault. Yes. <laughs> because they arrived perfect, mm -hmm. and I have somehow mismanaged. And right. I, I definitely have to a degree, every parent does, but I will tell you with a deep conviction that they were born, and by default, things were not, you know, like for example, we don't watch any violent stuff in our house. That's something that we, we just we just don't watch a lot of violence, or, or really any. Even as a kid, I grew up watching like uh, Looney Tunes. You know what I mean? And there's like anvils dropping and hammers and guns and stuff. And kids cartoons today, there is none of that. Like no. it is so much more tame. But yet all my kids have hit each other uh -huh. and punch. They've never seen me hit. They've never, you know what I mean? And it's like, yeah. it's like something there is born. And so there's that idea that if, if there is no original sin, then that means every problem that your children have, that's, that's on you. Cause mm -hmm. they came out perfect. Um, and I also find that our culture, even though it would be offended at the idea of original sin, in a fallen nature, they would view that as, as like, they, they actually our culture does believe that. Because how often do you hear phrases like, well, I'm only human. Mm -hmm. And in that phrase, I'm only human, there's a recognition that I'm weakness, I'm not, I'm, I'm, just, I'm only human, you know, and I'm not perfect, right? So even though there's this confusion in our culture that like, no, we are basically good, but I'm also, guys, I'm just, I'm just a person, I'm only human, Absolutely. right? And that speaks, I think, to the truth of original sin. It, it's, it's there. And uh, I've had moms, young moms say, well, my, ba my baby's perfect. I said, well, really, doesn't your baby cry when it's hungry and cry when it's soiled its diaper and cry when it wants attention and cry when, and then the mom always said, well, yes, but that's only human. Exactly right. what you said. Okay, yeah. No, but that's self, that's driven it's for driven what I have. Right, and, and, so, and so that's a core teaching of, of scripture that we are born. Absolutely core. And so we, right. we Jesus said okay. that, that troublesome verse that we just soon ignore, you are evil know how to give good gifts to your children who Ooh, ask. Yeah. How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Mm. I mean, Jesus said, we're evil. And, and one of the great freedoms of the gospel is we can be honest about that, not pointing fingers at anybody else other than ourselves and right. say, yeah, I'm fallen. Yeah, it's not shame. No, it, it's, it's truth. truth. It's, it's truth. like, hey, you know what? You're. <laughs> it's like if, I, if someone looked at me and, uh, you know, I, I, I love basketball. And, uh, and one of the, the unfortunate things about being five foot nine and loving basketball is that if you go play, you know, somewhere, you're never going to be the first person picked. Sure. If you're five nine, if you're playing well, if you're playing with a certain level of people, right? Like, and I get it, um, but it's not it's not shameful to tell me that I'm five nine. It's the truth. It's the truth. It's a, and and it's and it's an issue in, in the world of basketball. Um, well, similarly in life, I don't think that we live in a culture that's sometimes too sensitive. I think, and so saying that we have sin, saying that we are broken, whatever it might be is viewed as, as shame. But it's, it's like, uh, I, I don't have a low view of a car because I recognize that it needs gasoline to function, that it doesn't have the power within itself to drive itself. You know, I, that's not a low view of vehicles, that's a reality that Absolutely. They're, they're by design, you know what I mean? So, okay, so let's go back to plagiarism on this, let's tie, the, tie it together. Uh, original sin, means that if that's true, which Pelagian denied, we're, mm -hmm. Pelagian says we're born good, mm -hmm. so therefore, if you work hard enough, you, you, you will yourself, if you're disciplined you enough, and he was a super, he, he was uh, an aesthetic, right? Yeah, and a uh, brilliant man, there what, was no question. For everyone watching that doesn't, what, what, who are the aesthetics? What does that mean to be an aesthetic? Sought to separate themselves from the culture in order to live a better life. So extremely disciplined. Very disciplined. Uh, very, so very like legalistic, we might say yep. in our term, right? So it wasn't like, it wasn't like the Pelagian idea of you can do it turned into a real freedom and joy of living. It was, it was actually certainly not that. That's correct. Back, backbreaking kind that's of. That's another heresy. <laughs> gotcha. That's a different <laughs> yeah. one, right? Uh, so it was backbreaking, and it was uh -huh. like you better, you better work hard. And so Jesus, in the the Pelagian idea, he's just the example. He's the proof that we actually can do this. Mm -hmm. So quit making excuses. Do it. Who is Jesus really, though, to us? If 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 what Pelagian said isn't true, and we are born broken, and we don't we don't have everything within us to be holy and good, uh, if we have original sin, who does Jesus become in that scenario? He becomes the perfect offering, the offering much better than our own lives, even the much better offering than all those sheep and goats and rams that were offered throughout the centuries as a, a pleasing aroma to God. He became the perfect offering perfect offering and so by offering himself mm -hmm. 
he he we would say there's so many so much language we're talking about atonement basically yeah, now true. right uh, there's so much language in scripture of atonement sometimes it's talked about as a ransom sometimes it's talked mm-hmm. about as as an offering but but the idea is is Jesus covers us mm-hmm. right we couldn't do what Jesus did we couldn't live the life that he lived no matter how hard we tried so he did what we couldn't do and therefore he saves us his death on the cross wasn't just a good moral example to follow his death on the cross accomplished something. Right, and it also allows us not only to be prepared for heaven, Mm. but to live a different life now. That we can have a new nature, Mm. that we don't have to be driven only for self. Mm -hmm. We can be driven for others as as we allow the Lord to give us a new mind, a new heart. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so the... But but that's, I'm glad you said that. It's not, it's not of our own strength. Right. Right, it's not us trying harder, working harder, it's letting, the Holy Spirit work within us and transform us. Amen. Right. And so we always have to be on guard where we think we're either going to impress God with how good we are Mm -hmm. or we don't need Christ and the cross. No, we need Christ and the cross every moment of our lives. Mm -hmm. And not only in in realizing that we need to be forgiven, but being ready to forgive the sins of others and realize our spouse isn't perfect. Mm. Our kids are not perfect. Our boss are not, and, and just let it go. Forget That's so it. good because I, I would imagine that the Pelagian idea would also have very little grace for others. Very little, they, because, because they didn't need it themselves. Right, <laughs> and so other people's mistakes, it's not, you don't look at that person and say, you know, look, we, we none of us are perfect. And I'm just so glad that, I'm so glad <laughs> that the Lord's forgiven me of what he's forgiven me. Uh, and I will extend that to you as well. So. I, we'll, we'll wrap it up um, as we were talking about this uh, a little earlier last week actually um, it sort of struck me as you were talking that this really boils down to a question of whose whose righteousness whose goodness am I depending upon when it comes to me standing before the Father mm-hmm. in his presence um, you see this in scripture all the time like Isaiah when he's he has a vision and he's in the presence of, of God and his first reaction is not Wow, this is so cool! I'm so glad I'm here. It's like I am undone. What was like, me? I'm, yeah. You see that with even Peter, uh, mm-hmm. when Jesus, you know, tells him to cast the nets in the ocean and and this in the Sea of Galilee rather, and and they pull out all the fish, and Peter recognizes at this moment, oh, you're 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 not just a, a man. You know what I mean? You're the real deal. <laughs> he's he's like, Lord, leave me. I, I I can't. There's this understanding that I am not worthy of of being in the presence mm-hmm. of of God in and of myself. Um, that very much cuts against Pelagianism, Absolutely. right? Uh, but but in Pelagianism, I'm, I'm depending on my own righteousness, my own goodness. Mm-hmm. In, in Christianity, in, in following Jesus, I don't depend on my own goodness, my own righteousness. I depend on the righteousness of Jesus and His goodness given to me as a gift that I experience through faith in Him. And it's a surrendering of me saying, you know, Lord, I am not in and of myself. I, I am, Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Amen. But because of, of you, I have been brought in. I've been given something I could never have earned myself. One possible uh, word in closing, at least from my perspective, uh, one of the first guys I worked with in full-time ministry, he called me in one day just to chat. He was the senior pastor. And he said, Fred, no matter what you do in your entire life, just remember on that final day, when you're standing before the judgment of the Lord. And he asks, how do you plead? Remember, you plead guilty. Mm-hmm. And then when he asks, do you have anything more to plead? You say, yes, I plead the blood of Jesus. Mm-hmm. That's how we need to live as Christians. Mm-hmm. And that sets us free from Pelagianism. It sets it, and it sets us free from the constant feeling of failure. You know, mm-hmm. I think when you, like, uh, there's that disconnect of like, okay, if I am good enough, mm-hmm. then why do I keep... <laughs> What's wrong with What's me? Wrong with like me? Uh, yeah, that's the whole yeah. point of the world. If, if our world believes that everyone's born good, and it's only the environments that we live in that make us bad, well, then why do all these good people keep creating so many bad environments? Yep. You know what I mean? It's it's like a it's a paradox. And so, uh, okay, so Pelagianism, belief that uh, there is no original sin, meaning that we don't really need Jesus to save us. We just need we just need to to dig in and follow the example that Jesus set, and live a holy life that's pleasing to God mm-hmm. in and of our own strength. Um, which means extreme discipline, extreme just yep. devotion, but but with no 
no peace, no joy. It's not a, it's not a, a loving father relationship. Let me bring you in my presence. It's a demanding, you know, judge. judge. And, uh, and we don't, that cuts against the very core of our faith. Amen. It's his righteousness we depend on. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's, that's it for Pelagianism. I hope that you learned something that, uh, that you didn't know, but I think the main thing is we continue exploring more of these in the future. We'll do more episodes. Uh, these ideas, they, they, they're still around. Still around. They're still around, and they, they have a tendency to mix in uh, with our faith. I find that one of the things when I talk to people, when I talk to Jesus followers, is there's this tendency to take the core teachings of Jesus and then a lot of these ideas in the world, um, like the, some of the ideas of Pelagianism, mm -hmm. are very prevalent today, mm -hmm. and sort of create a cocktail. You know, bring them together, and uh, and it it just it waters down and undermines the real power of. I'm so glad that it's not on me. Amen. To please the Lord, that Jesus did what I could never do. Amen. You know. All right, man. Well, thank you guys. Episode one of Lies So Clever. We will see you uh, very very soon. Thanks for watching.